Welcome to the last of the Call High Wildcats 1982 podcast, brought to you by Deep Soul Man Productions. Drift off uh, in my sleep and die. And so I began writing, uh, I, I took the paper and the clipboard out of the trail registry, and I began drafting letters uh, to my children, uh, to my family, my mother and two sisters, and my friend Mark, and then also to whoever the unfortunate person was gonna be that was gonna find me. Right? Mm. This horrible idea that, you know, somebody at some point is going to find me there. And sort of accepted what was gonna happen and, and it probably merits saying that years ago, uh, my friend Mark, one of the three that I've mentioned, he and I had pledged to each other that when our time came, and, and our time is going to come, so if there's anybody out there that's confused, I can assure you that the statistical probability of death uh, remains constant at 100%. Uh, none of us, <laughs> to quote Jim Morrison, nobody gets out of here alive. Scott Townsend, welcome back to the last of the Call High Wildcats 1982 podcast. And today, once again, I have with me fellow Wildcatter. They are ha have been in the energy finance industry. Uh, they uh, are a have joined the faculty at the OU Price College of Business. I knew I was going to stumble over that. And the, and this person has two wonderful twin daughters, Meredith and Jessica. Uh, welcome to the show, Ron Butch Bolin. How's it going? Going great. Thanks so much for having me on, Scott. I appreciate it. So, <clears throat> as you know, we've had on, you know, this is uh, kind of a new project uh, we've been doing. Yes. We've had Chris Zervis, Stacey Dennis, Donnie Moreland, Glenn Goodrich, um, Brett Thomason. And yes. now you really appreciate your time, taking the time to visit with us and catch all of us wildcatters up on what's been going on in the last 39 years. Right, well, I will, I do wanna, I, I wanna sort of begin by thanking you for having me on. And I think what you're doing is wonderful. I, you know, I mentioned right before we, we came on air here that, you know, I'm not sure how many people around the country would even think about doing this. So what you're doing for us is, is incredible. The second thing I'd add is after I saw the Chris Service and Donnie Moreland interviews, I almost canceled on you because, while I have suspected for a long time there might be vampires that walk amongst us, uh, those two guys confirmed it because they're actually getting younger. I, I, I saw I saw Chris in person uh, a couple three years ago, I guess, and it hurt. Uh, but then to see him on camera, it hurt yeah. just a little bit more. So now those the, it was it was intimidating to sort of see those folks. And Donnie is such a great storyteller too. I need to have him back on because uh, he's just oh. hilarious. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I loved his conversation. Yeah. So uh, you know, so we got the college high here. Uh, last of the call high Wildcats. Uh, if we go back into, we'll go into several different uh, uh, paths here in the conversation. But uh, if we if we were to go back in a time machine, just kind of want to. I'll give you a lightning round of questions here. Why don't we do that? And I've not done this with anybody before, so I'm going to just rattle off some uh, questions and you answer as fast as you can, just top of mind. You got it. What car did you drive? 1974 three quarter ton Ford pickup until really my senior year, and I got a 1980 Ford Mustang hatchback. Oh, cool. uh, the Gia I remember it was the Gia model, which I am certain they canceled quickly thereafter. But yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when you think of a band from high school, what band comes to mind? You know, it, 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 it's a little bit interesting. I, I've heard this question before from you uh, to others. Yeah, you, you know, you, there was sort of that 38 special fog hat sort of rock and roll journey sticks. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was I was sort of vacillating a bit between pop and jazz. So I saw I was a Huey Lewis and the News fan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then also I uh, was listening to like Jean Luc Ponty. You know, so the the jazz violinist, uh, sort of pretty eclectic, wide ranging. But uh, that was uh, I, I tell my students now at the university that uh, our generation made Duran Duran famous, and we apologize. That's sort of. <laughs> <funny>. <laughs> I don't think they're ever going to forgive us for that one. No, no. Uh, if I mentioned a sport, what would it have been? For me or just in general you. in high school? Yeah, I, I was not particularly athletically inclined to say the least in high school, but uh, um, 
you know, for, for me, uh, it, it, it would have been sort of this attending the football games, attending the basketball games. Ironically, so I know you've, you've interviewed Glenn Goodrich. So uh, during the summers, Glenn and I actually used to run together. We'd get up early in the morning and we'd run through this sort of uh, uh, basically a, a, a rural area behind his parents' home. And we'd sort oh, of yeah. a couple of miles and run in the, in the morning. So I guess you could put that in there. Hmm. There is a picture of you in the uh, yearbook playing racquetball. racquetball you know that's boy you know i'll claim donnie moreland's excuse here you know rattling around a 57 year old brain i forgot about yeah. that that's right so mark uh, kelly and i played uh, racquetball quite religiously so we were we were on the courts probably two to five times a week uh, yeah. it's great sport. loved it yeah so, and of course my brain's not triggering it <laughs> yeah, David Neer, Keith Clark, I, and, and others, we lived on the racquetball courts oh, at, at the Y. It's such a great game. Oh, such a great game. And and um, there was a, a young man, I think he was maybe a year or two behind us, who was like competitive player. Uh, his father was a, a big player at the Y. And then he, young yeah. Tom, Paul I remember who you're, Yeah, I remember exactly who you're talking amazing, about. Amazing player. Yep. And I, yeah, I can't think of his name either, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Um, friend. Jim Webb, Mark Kelly. Um, there were a couple of folks in there, Jason Casto and Todd Meyerdirk. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was in that first Baptist group like you. So mm -hmm. that included uh, Ronda Rizzo Webb, that included Lisa Hutchins, that included others mm -hmm. uh, that went through there. Um, uh, a great, a great circle of friends. Teacher Jim, Jim I, I sort of always credit Jim for my only connection to the cool kids, right? So, <laughs> to say I was was not uh, not in that circle would be an understatement of the decade. But I, I had friendship with Jim, and so from seventh grade forward, yeah. uh, I might have been one of the dorks, but at least I had a friend that was cool, so I could hang out with him. Yeah, Jim, the facilitator. Absolutely, uh, teacher. Yeah, so a bit of a broken record, Sue Reynolds. Uh, family mm. living was extraordinarily impactful, but you know, someone who hasn't been mentioned, and, and again, and I, I just want to digress for a moment, it's real easy to forget how grateful we should be about the education we received. Right. This is public education in a <laughs> rural state in the US. Um, we received a, a top tier public education. Um, I hope I have this name correct. Dan Simmons. He was our English literature professor. Um, Dan Simmons. Mr. Simmons, if you could, yeah, grab your your handy uh, yearbook and see. Yeah. Uh, really drove in uh, a passion for reading. He, you know, first person that made me crack open um, Shakespeare. So, uh, really influenced me as far as uh, reading. Um, I sort of credit him with a, a lot of that. And of course, like everyone else, I think it was John Baird. Mm -hmm. sort of pushing through sort of whatever we called AP back then. Yeah, so you were you were the uh, uh, <clears throat> drum major. Yeah, that's that's uh, in, unfortunate you should mention that. So can we cut that? Can we edit that? Up? I, I, I claim that I was running with a bad crowd and I just got caught up. Yeah, no, no, I was the drum major, the photograph of which, and, and if you show it, my lawyer is striking. Yeah. That we will call you within the hour, um, yeah. and so, but no, it's it's funny uh, um, that picture shows up quite a bit. Uh, yeah, no, I was I was drum major of the band. So, John Baird Society, John Baird Society, the Gene Dean Association, which was the science uh, group. Um, yeah, was, in, in all honesty, especially now, sort of my second career teaching at the university level. Um, I can I can say unequivocally that that we received a a first class education. Yeah, and it shows. It shows. In fact, I always ask my students, you know, who's from Bartlesville, so we can talk about that. There's a picture of the uh, JDA toga party. What was that all about? <laughs> so I believe I believe that was at Tim Brenner's home. If I I may be wrong about that, but um, if I remember correctly. Jim Webb was president. I was vice president. I think John Lacey was secretary, mm. uh, a name you maybe not have thought of in a while. So John Lacey, yeah, uh, being you know trying desperately to be rebels, but 
also advanced chemistry. It's not really a, a combo you're going to find. So <laughs> I think the wildest thing we could come up with was a toga party. I think uh, um, Animal House had just been released, what, in 79, 80, something like that. Oh, and so, yeah. yeah, we had a toga party at, uh, at uh, this home. And I, I want to say Tim Brenner. I'm not sure that's correct. But uh, yeah, it was just a, a fun party to to sort of celebrate all the hard work that we were going through in that class. Speaking of rebels, there's that one picture of you and <clears throat> there's a whole class and you and I think Jimmy and John with the glass sunglasses on. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is uh, um, trying this, hard to be rebels. Yeah, exactly. This is the substitute for actual rebellion. Uh, <laughs> you know, nerdy, nerdy science students wearing sunglasses. Ooh, we were we were living out on the razor's edge with that one. Yeah. Thanks to the Wayfarers. Exactly. Um, exactly. Prom. Prom, I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to claim age if I miss the name, I believe it was Lisa Martin when our senior year double dated with Tim Brenner and his date. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, Lisa Martin and, and I went to prom senior year. Uh, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? When you were, when you were in high school, what did you, when people ask you that stupid question, what did you sure. say? Um, I would have said something in business. I didn't know, um, and it and it was, you know, it, I know you've already touched on the subject with with some others. Yeah, it, I was in a. Uh, I guess if I was going, thought I was going to be anything, is I was going to desperately become an adult, whatever I thought that meant. And so I spent way too much energy and way too much time desperately trying to get to whatever adulthood was, mm -hmm. and whether that had been a professional career you know, wearing a suit and tie and going to an office every day or whether it was owning a business and running. I, I had no idea. I was just in this uh, unhealthy urgency to uh, to become an adult, to grow up, if you will. So right. I don't know exactly, but it was probably going to be business if you ask me. I think that's what we all kind of suffered through was trying to grow up as fast as we could. And you know, now, and we're, given, now we're trying to slow things down. Yeah, I've given this an awful lot of thought over the years, you know, the community of Bartlesville, which is so unique and, and just wonderful in so many ways, um, probably fostered that a bit more than maybe if we had been in a different community. I mean, the, the I don't remember the stats. You, you certainly will know them better than I. I think you indicated 296 in our graduating class. Mm -hmm. like Something like that, yeah, give you or know, take. On a percentage basis, the people that, that then left to attend a four-year university or college or to do some sort of education post high school was ridiculously high when compared to the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, Phillips headquarters was there at the time, right, drove, I think, many of us to, to view that as sort of the, the, the apex, the epitome of what we were destined to do. So two more questions, TV show, TV show, boy, that's a great one. You know, I, I was a huge fan of Gilligan's Island. Um, <laughs> it, it, but of course, you know, that was, I, if I remember correctly, that was during the period we sort of had, uh, I think it was ABC that dominated mm -hmm. the, the lineup. And I remember, I think, forgive me if I'm wrong with this, I think it was Friday nights, there was, you know, The Love Boat and Fantasy Island and then like Dynasty or something. There was a, there was a, a run there that uh, uh, you know, we sort of watched. I would say also that um, continuing along the um, uh, nerd uh, factor in high school, uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus every Saturday <laughs> night on PBS at 10 p.m. Had to, <laughs> you know, had, to, had to get in off the, the cruising of the cars in time to watch Monty Python. So yeah. Talk about I'm sure my therapist will un unbundle that for a decade. I've had so many people tell me to watch that show. Now you, so uh, my wife. Gotta get on it. Check Gotta that get out. On it. Yeah. <laughs> get on the Ted Lasso bandwagon, Scott. Funniest memory of high school. Funniest memory of high school. There were two probably. Um, the, the the car being put into the Love. foyer, which a lot of people reference. Um, actually, there's one that's not as well known. Jim Webb and I had uh, found that we could take our English credit for senior year 
between the summer of our junior and senior year in high school. So we could we could knock that credit out of the way. And if you recall, Jim uh, worked at, uh, I believe it was called Dairy Berry Jewelers every day after school. And I had mm. an after school job and our, our, our thought was, look, if we can knock down some of our credits, our senior year, certainly our second semester senior year could be three to four classes tops. And then we'd have this additional time to either work or goof off or whatever we did. And so Jim and I went into we enrolled and, and we showed up on the first day of this senior English course uh, at the high school. And the I, I apologize, I don't remember uh, the instructor's name, but she came over to Jim and I and, and said, what are you two doing here? And we're like, well, look, we if we take this class now, we can, we can eliminate it from our requirements our senior year. And she said, this course is for the students who have failed English their senior year and are having to repeat. And we were like, yeah, good, okay, we'll do it. And she looked at us and said, write one paper and get the hell out of the class, you'll pass. So we, we wrote a paper and then Jim, uh, uh, this is really going down memory lane, uh, best yet grocery store students. Yeah, yeah. And they had just received a new video game, uh, Centipede. Mm -hmm. And so I think Jim and I, uh, uh, spent the time that we should have been in class studying English, learning how to play centipede and, and feeding the <laughs> machine quarters probably for the entire summer. Chains, games, you know, there was... Chains, the... game. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I remember, there's a picture, I think, in the yearbook of George Davis. You know, George is one of those, if, 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 I, if I understand correctly, um, I think George ended up winning the Rhodes Scholarship Really? Uh, I, I, I believe his PhD is from Oxford. I'm, I'm, I please don't, yeah. please don't put me on that. Somebody please out there research this. I think George yeah. uh, went on to uh, run a couple of successful ventures um, for in the NASA community in Alabama. Um, but you know, again, looking at these, and I think Brett did a wonderful job of explaining you know, the difficulty in choosing the valedictorian. We had. And I may have these numbers off. So again, please somebody correct me. I think we had four or six early graduates. Mm -hmm. Allison Holtz had graduated. Mm -hmm. You know, Allison went on to get her PhD at Cambridge. She worked for the parliament for a number of years. She's now a professor at, at Humboldt State uh, in California. Mm -hmm. these, these are powerhouse brains that we had around yeah. us. And um, uh, so I, I would say, you know, looking at that, the, this was a, a pretty remarkable place to be uh, be getting your education. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I digress here from a George, I remember was he would compete in asteroids video game competition. <laughs> oh man, Miss Pac-Man, Pac-Man. Keith, I think was like Miss Pac-Man King or something, you know. He... Yes, well, I, to I told uh, my students, my students are always asked, will you play video games? I'm gonna, I think the last video game I played was Defender, so I doubt I'm an expert on the topic. <laughs> so, all right, enough of the lightning round. So bring us up to speed. What's uh, been going on with Butch Bowl in the last 39 years? What, uh, if wow. you could give me a tour of, sure. uh, you know, for a 35,000 foot view of uh, your life in the last 39 years, what did that look like? Um, uh maybe a, a bit more linear than some of the people you've, you've talked to already. Um, Stacy Dennis has had an amazing life. I'm, I'm a bit in awe of everybody, but um, so uh, went to undergrad at the University of Oklahoma, got a degree in finance, and then immediately went to law school there. So I was, I was actually in Norman for seven years for education, hmm. uh, practiced law for about five years, and then um, uh, exclusively uh, corporate and securities work, primarily mergers and acquisitions. And then uh, went to uh, NYU, New York University in Manhattan to get my MBA, um, married uh, uh, right after law school, Sharon Wentz, who is two years younger than us. She was a sophomore when we were senior. Our first mm -hmm. day was uh, my senior year, her sophomore year. We married uh, the summer following law school, um, moved to uh, New York. We had twins, so Jessica and Meredith, uh, who are now 27, um, sort of did the prototypical MBA thing. So graduated uh, with an MBA, went onto Wall Street as an investment banker. So serviced the energy industry, primarily hydrocarbon recovery uh, for uh, several years as just a 
an investment banker, right? Getting people money that need money and merging companies, et cetera. Left there to uh, uh, go into corporate work. So I worked for a large international energy company, um, really started traveling overseas. So at that point, the majority of my work was uh, both in the former Soviet Union and South and Southeast Asia. So lived on an airplane for about a decade. Oh, uh, man. I, in fact, I was telling uh, uh, Glenn Goodrich, actually, who we talked earlier, uh, this, the, the shaved head. I, I began cutting my hair short uh, during that period because I, you know, 22 hours on an airplane, my hair would be standing up. So I started cutting it back and then uh, ultimately decided to just shave the head in, in a, a, a remarkably failed attempt to hide the gray. Uh, but um, did that for a number of years and then joined a venture capital fund uh, focused on internet, uh, energy technology. And so um, venture capital is investing in early stage companies. So back to uh, about 27 startups, uh, had a great time. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, job uh, doing that. And then got the bug to be an entrepreneur myself. And, and uh, I will tell you, I teach that now. I tell my students, um, I must have been drinking or something because I thought, well, how hard is it to be an entrepreneur? I mean, I finance these people. They're, uh, I, I'm probably as smart as them. And so we, uh, a business partner and I launched a, uh, a very boutique um, international project finance company uh, back in 01. Uh, we grew it till 04 and then sold it to a, a large private equity fund uh, out of Chicago. And I stayed on and worked for that fund for about uh, four more years. So in 08, I basically retired. I, didn't know what I was going to do. And my daughter, Jessica, had uh, said to me, you know, this is like uh, being home from school when all your friends are still in class. Like, what are you going to do? Like, all your friends are still working. And so I, uh, I began getting involved. So I, I went on the board of the MBA program at OU to try to, uh, to give something back. I've been doing some guest lectures at the university. And I had enough other things that were kind of keeping me, me busy during the day to keep me out of the pool halls. Um, and then was asked if I would consider going back to uh, to OU to teach, and and uh, the twins were were just about to graduate from high school at that point, um, and so I said, well, you know, I haven't really given any thought, but let me give so, so thought about it and said, yes, I, you know, I, I'll do this. In fact, we were we were all living in Houston at the time. Um, Sharon and I had divorced. We're we're still great friends. Um, I was on the phone with her two hours last night. Um, uh, she and her husband and I are all all still very close, and um, but but she and I we are all in Houston, and so it kind of timed out perfectly. I, I joke that the twins and I went to college on the same day. So Jessica went to the University of Texas for undergrad. Meredith went to Westminster College, where where Jimmy Webb went, and uh, I went to OU or back to OU on the same day. Wow. And I didn't even sell my house in Houston. I kept the house because I thought you know I'm going to do this for a couple of years. I I just built this home really loved it. And so I didn't sell the house. And then after two years, realized I had fallen in love with teaching. Hmm. Um, perhaps one of the more rewarding things I've ever done. And what is it about it, teaching? It, that you just, like so much? It, it just finished my ninth year. I'm sorry, say again. What is it about teaching that you like so much? You know, I was, and I, I don't know how you felt about this at Oklahoma State. I was a frustrated student. Um, oh, yeah. Really at the undergraduate level, law school, business school is a little bit different. So by the time I hit my MBA, it was a bit, but I was frustrated because I, I felt that at least at the undergraduate level, my, my professors couldn't offer me anything. You know, I, I, you know, I would say, I'm not trying to be rude, but I was like, you know, I can read a textbook. I can look at PowerPoint slides. What do you, what else do you have to give me? Right. Um, and so uh, when I was given the opportunity to go back and do a guest lecture or speak on a particular topic, <clears throat> I've been so fortunate that I've been able to intersperse stories, right? So I can I can tell a classroom. So, for example, not to bore you or your poor audience that's watching this to death. So there's a thing called the just uh, us wildcats, man. Just us. Yeah, just wildcats. Well, so there's a thing in the in the federal law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act says if an American pays a bribe in the course of business, um, the American goes to prison, right? It's a criminal act, it's federal criminal law. And, and so you can 
tell students, I, I used to teach an entrepreneurial law class, or I, so I can explain the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, we can read the act, we can look at some cases, but I think it's a lot more compelling for me to tell a story about being in Indonesia, negotiating a deal with the government who's expecting a bribe and, and, and sort of having to work our way through that without, right. without succumbing. And, and I, I hope, I, I think it does. I think it, it, you know, resounds a bit more and the students get it. And of course, then I just get completely energized. The, the, the idea that I get to spend my days around young minds who are eager to learn and they still have energy and, and they've not, uh, they've not yet decided what they're going to do. And to be able to participate in some small way in that is, is just, it's unbelievable. It's one of the, the best jobs you could ever imagine. Plus you so, get some. So. Yeah. And that's almost like uh, being in the entertainment business. A it's, bit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny when you mentioned, and I must admit, I didn't realize you were at Disney for a period of time, but I would say it's that, right. It's you're, you're, along with educating, you have to have some sort of performance in there to keep everyone's attention so they can get right. content. And so I, I, I would love it sometime, and we can do it now or, or, or some point in the future. I'd love to hear about your experience there because it must be must be fascinating. Oh, yeah, it was, it was great. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, it's funny because they, they call their employees cast members. And when you go to work, you go on stage. So when you're on work, you're on stage. Oh, and wow. so the whole terminology, the whole thought process around what everybody's doing is if you're the janitor or if you're the CEO, you're all on stage trying to create this memorable experience for people. And so everybody's working together. Uh, when you have your, when you put your when you go to uh, get your uh, uniform, it's called a costume. And, you know, so you're, and, and then when you go on stage, there are certain things you can and you can't do. Um, so it was just a real uh, immersion in, uh, yes. regardless of whether you're an intern, which I started out as, and then went to guest relations at Epcot. Uh, every, you know, even if you're on the phone with someone, they had mirrors uh, in front of you to make sure you were smiling because when you smile your voice changes just a little bit becomes a little bit more friendly and so they've just thought of everything and so it was really it was really cool you know in in academic speak which i'm i'm not an academic but but i've been around it enough now to get so uh large organizations struggle with something called overarching goal right how do i communicate that everybody plays a role in the overall success of this goal, whatever that may be, increasing shareholder value, you know, acquisition, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And um, boy, that one sounds powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I love your description. So I've been, I've been fortunate enough in my, my career to manage a few teams uh, in different areas. And, and my, my policy has been from then and, and even to today, if, if, if the lowest level employee doesn't feel comfortable talking to me, that's my fault. That, yeah. That's not their fault. That means I have I have set a stage that's incorrect, and they don't understand, or I've not communicated how important they are enough that they feel like they have standing to talk to me. In fact, uh, um, it is. I, I love what Disney has done there. I've had several friends uh, at corporate Disney uh, over the years, but uh, I love the way they've driven it down. That's that's a fantastic story. Yeah, it was a great learning experience. Probably one of the best learning experiences I've had since I, uh, I since imagine. 1982. Uh, stuff I've carried with me all through the. Nice uh, bounce back to years. topic, Scott Townsend. <laughs> <laughs> Way to feed it back in. This guy's a pro. Yes, no, that's that's absolutely correct. You know, it is, it is absolutely true. You know that, that there are lessons all of us took, whether they be explicit or subconscious, even um, from that time there that I think have have served us well through the through the years. So let's uh, let's get to what everybody is probably chomping at the bit for once at wondering when is he going to ask the question, you know? Um, so here we go. You know, we were in 30 some odd minutes into the interview and, and I uh, didn't want to make this all about yes. the hike, which everyone knows about uh, right now, but it is, it's, I'm going to start off about the hike and then I'm going to, Throw it over to you. <clears throat> As you wish. So it was 
when was it? Uh, Tuesday, um, July, was it 16th? 13th. 13th. Yeah, July 13th. And there was this uh, post on Facebook uh, last on the last call high Wildcats 1982 page about uh, that you had gone missing. Yes. So it was, wow. I mean, that's, I mean, that's for me, that was shocking. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and then news reports started coming out. And I found myself, this is on, I, I'm just telling you the truth here. I'm, Please. I found myself obsessed with this story. Thank you. And I found myself sitting at the computer, uh, just waiting for the next update. Thank you. And <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, you've heard of stories like this and they don't, don't generally turn out well. Correct. And, uh, and it was just, uh, you know, so then I started trying to put myself in your shoes. It's the third night. Yes. Now I'll let you get into all the, all that, but I kept trying to think about what, what would I be doing, you know, at this point? What, I mean, I would be, I don't know, I'd be freaked out. I mean, it's just, it's just, I couldn't imagine. I, I, I couldn't get myself to that place and so and reddit community was unbelievable unbelievable thank you for listening to the last of the call high wildcats 1982 podcast and we'll be right back after this Pops Daylight Donuts, man, they've got the best tasting donuts, sausage wraps, pastries in Northeast Oklahoma. And also, if you'll tell the staff there, hey, Scott Townsend said to give me a large spicy pig, they'll give you a free large spicy sausage wrap. But you have to tell them Scott Townsend sent you. So tell them, hey, Scott Townsend told me to tell you to give me a large spicy pig. So there's the offer. There's the there's the call to action. So go to Pops Daylight Donuts, say hi to Mark for me, and uh, yeah, go to Pops Daylight Donuts and get you some. The other sponsor is Castafly Outdoor Adventures. Adventure, that's where it begins. We look to create and document our moments in time while embracing the majestic wonder and beauty of the great outdoors. Our quest, is to explore the back roads of the Ozarks, camping, fishing, and just getting lost. Refresh your spirit and join us on our next adventure. Paul and his crew invite you to subscribe to the Castafly Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel. The Reddit come uh, people uh, got behind the search. Um, Somebody said uh, you should write a, you know, if you know the governor of Nevada or whatever, send it. So I sent an email to the governor of Nevada and I said, hey, I uh, got a friend at uh, this location, you know, and I would, I would really appreciate it if you bumped this up the, uh, yeah, if you'd run this up the flagpole and see about getting some help sent that way. I've never done that before. Um, but there are so many people that were doing that and on Facebook, same thing. Yes. And then, and so Saturday, Friday night, Friday night, my wife and I were going to go to, we're going to bed. And, and so, and so I, I said, so let's say a prayer for Ron. And so we did. And, uh, Thank and you. then, uh, Saturday, the unbelievable, I mean, the, the news that they, that you'd been found, found alive, yes. you know, and of course, at this point, we didn't know what condition, whatever, you know, but right. just, it was, it was like, it usually doesn't turn out like this. And no, so no. it was just incredible. The, the relief that I know everybody felt, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so 
that was my experience. Now, I'm, you know, I'm going to turn this thing over to you. Let's start <laughs> with hiking. So how did, how did yeah. you get into hiking and why did you go to, what did you pick? What was it Boundary? Boundary Peak. Boundary Peak. Peak. Um, yeah. So there's a, first of all, if you, if you'll indulge me, you know, yeah. so it's all yours really beginning Saturday afternoon when I was released from the ER and Jimmy Webb, right? Jim Webb is there taking me to the ER in Nevada. I began saying the work of my life from this point forward will be telling people, thank you. Um, it is still the thing I struggle with the most is trying to get my head around everybody that got involved. And I don't mean just in this physical sense of, you know, flying rescue helicopters or whatever it was, so many people have gotten involved. And, and, and to be honest with you, I, I bear a little bit of guilt. I, I feel responsible because on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, I was the only person that knew I was alive. I was the only yeah. person that knew I was mostly unhurt. And, and by that time, I, I had come to grips with the fact that people were looking and, and there was probably this concern going, I had no idea it was going to be this large. I had a a dear friend tell me, you know, this was my, it's a wonderful life moment. And, and certainly one of the things I intend to take away from this, we don't, that's not fair. I'm not going to put this on anybody else. I had no idea that the outpouring of love and support that was going to come my way existed. And it has been challenging to sort of wrap my head around. We, we joke about it all the time on Reddit, uh, Chug Life 2000. Yeah. This guy won't even give us his name. Yeah, I remember that. Doesn't want any recognition. He had just gone to the mountain with two friends to try to find me. And those are amazing stories. How to get that around? And and so to sort of back up to answer your original question. So so I guess I would say thank you for giving me the platform to tell others thank you. Um, that has been uh, my number one goal through all of this is to tell people thank you and to tell them how grateful I am for everything that they did. Um, but, but so how did this happen? Well, so um, years ago, I, I really enjoyed cycling, road cycling, sort of like Keith Clark, right? So yeah, uh, I raced a bit in college and um, had done a number of, of sort of um, rides and races since college. And then had a, had an accident and broke my wrist and, so began running as an alternative and then that sort of turned into marathons. So I did about 12 marathons, ran the last three with my daughter, Meredith and Meredith oh, cool. that you may remember is the one that really spearheaded the rescue efforts. Yeah. Um, it was, it was fascinating. I'll digress just for a moment. Um, Jessica had just begun her residency in um, pediatric medical genetics and human genomics at Memorial Hermann and hospital in Houston. And so she had very, very limited time. Meredith is a teacher. Meredith went to Westminster and then moved to Rwanda, Africa for two years and taught oh, wow. at a little boarding school there and then came back and got her master's at Harvard and then is now is teaching in, in Houston. But Meredith had the summer off. And in fact, I had spent the early part of the summer with her, but Meredith began assigning tasks to everyone around her to sort of assist in the rescue efforts mm -hmm. and so gave jessica the task of running reddit because jessica could do that between patients but you know with this demanding schedule of a new resident and um reading that has been amazing so uh but but really meredith's work uh sort of leading the efforts has been sort of life-changing for me uh, i mentioned the other day that uh, you know how many parents get the opportunity to say to their child i owe you my life and that's, that's sort of a big deal. But so anyway, so running leads to triathlons, leads to uh, sort of the, the lethargy that starts when you're working a lot of hours and spending a lot of time on airplanes. And so I, I, I had run again a little bit, but I was like, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm aging out of running. I need to do something safer. So why not uh, climbing and hiking? I've always enjoyed uh, doing that sort of thing. In fact, Jim Webb and I worked at a, a sports camp following our senior year. So oh, the yeah. summer too, Jim and I worked at a sports camp down in Texas, uh, teaching uh, rock climbing and rappelling. Hmm. And so I began hiking and climbing and, and um, have been doing that for uh, the last five, seven years, maybe. Uh, I guess really going a little bit further than that. But anyway, so that has sort of been my, my 
my outlet, one of my exercise, sort of certainly one of my passions. And then becoming a, a professor moving into academics freed up my summer. So it gave me a lot more time to participate in the, in the activity. So um, why I chose boundary um, is because it's the high point in Nevada. So there's this sort of little thing people do, which is, oh, I'm gonna hit the high point in every state. So I'd done, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota. I'd already done New Mexico, although I repeated it right before yeah, the big. That's cool. The, the demanding uh, Arkansas, Missouri, Jim Webb was with me for those. We, we joke about that because there's like a sidewalk up to the to the high point in the state. But these are just, <laughs> these aren't really things that you're trying to accomplish. It's just a reason to get out and hike and climb. Sure, and, yeah, the bucket so, list. The bucket list, exactly. And so I had begun, I'd gone to North Dakota and South Dakota with Meredith, brought her back. And then I began working my way west because I have some friends in uh, California that we we hike and climb together for a week each summer in the Eastern Sierras. So we drove to Taos, New Mexico and climbed Wheeler Peak, which is I think 13,040 feet uh, just north of Taos, High Point, New Mexico, drove then to Flagstaff, Arizona, climbed Humphreys Peak, which is like 12,800. I don't keep up with the numbers exactly. And then moved over to Nevada to Boundary Peak to catch the high point there, go to the Sierras and then come down and climb Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in California. Hmm. Um, Boundary Peak is a, is a, a daunting uh, um, hike. It's uh, 13,000 160, I think, um, but it is 200 miles in circumference. It's a it's an unbelievably uh, rough terrain and very very rarely traveled. Really, a, a, a good example might be this. So Wheeler Peak in, in New Mexico, which is very popular. If, you, if you've skied Taos, you've actually been right next to Wheeler Peak. Um, any given day during the summer, there's going to be 100 to 150 people hiking that mountain, and so. You never lose sight of another human being. And in fact, once you break out above the tree line at about 10,000, 9,000, 10,000 feet, you just sort of see this stream of human beings. You can always sort of see them. But hmm. Boundary Peak, there were only two of us that summited that day, the 13th, and only eight that attempted for the week. So this is a, a very rarely uh, uh, hiked uh, summit. It's four and a half hours north of Las Vegas. It's near the, the uh, Death Valley. There's really not much infrastructure around there, um, but uh, that's what put me up there. And sort of that was just part of this this sort of longer trip this summer where I was high pointing uh, a number of states. And so then you took that selfie that we all, uh, all the wildcats know about. And uh, so after the selfie, what happened? Take, us, take us back down the mountain. Well, I, you know, I have to, I have to say this. So several years ago, um, we had, we, my, my daughters and I developed a safety protocol where I would always text at the start, text at the summit if I could, and then text back at the base, um, which really went a long way to um, alerting everyone what had happened. So it took me seven hours to summit. So it was a seven hour climb up to uh, the peak, sign the summit registry, right? This is a box, ammo box, and they have the little huh. sign sheet there and you get a little picture, you know, so, so I took cool. a selfie. Uh, which is not my style generally, but uh, I sent it to the kids and said, hey, I've got cell service right here. I summited. And then I began working my way back down. And, and there's a very long ridge line that leads to what I'm going to call the correct trail back down to my car. Um, but there are three major outcroppings. You have to sort of work your way around coming down that ridge line. And, and I, I, I stumbled at one of those outcroppings and I fell and I, I say I felt I tumbled about three body links, two to three body links down the mountain. Wasn't injured. I twisted my ankle a little bit, but it wasn't. Yeah. There was nothing wrong. So but what now, time? What time did you summit? Sorry. So I, I summited at twelve forty-five p.m. So how long did you estimate it was going to take you to get back to the car? A five-hour descent. So it was okay. seven hours up, five down was my calculation. Okay. Turned out to be seven hours up, five days down. Is really really horrible. <laughs> my math <laughs> way off that day. Anyway. Right. I, I will tell you just because I know some people are interested in this. So at 12.15 p.m., 30 minutes before I summited, I was about 600 feet below the summit and I, I ate a, a little protein cookie. And I actually texted my friend, Mark McConnell, one of the rescuers uh, that found me and said, hey, I'm about 600 feet from the summit. I'm gonna push up here in just a little bit, but I'm, I'm resting, I'm drinking some water, I'm gonna eat this. So 
from 1215 Tuesday until 1130 Saturday, um, I ate three quarters of one cliff bar. And that was oh all, I, all I had in my pack. And so I was rationing that out through the days. Uh, but anyway, so I started to stumble. The correct move that we now hopefully have all learned from me, even with my thick skull, it's gotten through. I should have climbed my way back up to the trail and continued along the ridge line to get to what's called the saddle, which leads to the scree field, which leads to the trail uh, back to the automobile. But I thought, well, look, I'm just going to angle down the face of the mountain. If, you know, I will intersect with that downward trail on a 45 degree angle. And that, that, that was wrong. I actually ended up down a wrong valley um, Tuesday afternoon. I knew I was in the wrong valley, but my, my calculation was, well, I can get to the end of the valley, get into the meadow, turn left, and I can still get to my vehicle at the trailhead. Um, but that valley began to pinch off. I had run out of hydration at that point, so I was out of water, uh, which I always carry extra. I had three liters with me for the day, but I'd run out of water. And so I thought, well, I'm going to hunker down. I'll sleep out under a tree. I'll get up Wednesday morning and I'll begin making my way back up the mountain uh, where I can find the trail and get down. And, and nobody wants to do it, but I put on my rain gear. I, you know, I was a little bit chilly, but I, I was under a tree. Wasn't worried. Didn't even, to be honest with you, wasn't even nervous. I had a little bit of battery left in my cell phone. I was kind of bummed out. I was thinking, eh, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the Sierras, but I wasn't concerned. Wednesday morning, I woke up quite early. I began climbing my way back up to 10,000 feet and traversed the face of the mountain all day looking for the trail, which I now know I could not see. There was a 12,000 foot ridge line that I actually had to be above to be able to find my way to the correct trail. But during that day, I found another valley that I, it looked like I could climb through and get down into this sort of open valley area, if you will. Began that descent, uh, made it to about 8,500 feet, really about 8,000 feet Wednesday afternoon. Um, could not make it. Uh, I was pretty zapped. Um, now I've gone another afternoon without hydration. Um, I'm not feeling well. Uh, it was getting into the mid 90s, you know, during the day, low, mm -hmm. low 40s, mid 40s in the in the evening. So I I just like I had done Tuesday night, I sort of found a high plateau to sleep on. I laid out all my gear in an attempt that if there was a helicopter that flew over, they would see my my gear and maybe rescue me, but sort of went to sleep Wednesday night um, thinking, well, you know, the cavalry's not coming. This is up to you. You're going to have to get yourself down. And so I got up Thursday morning and I began exploring this plateau I was on and I could, I could hear water running, which was a great relief because it meant there's a stream somewhere. And I, mm -hmm. I could see where I thought the streams were very, very heavy vegetation, but I basically gathered up my gear, put it in the backpack. I took my trekking poles off and I put them in a straight line, an angled line down the valley, trying to indicate if a helicopter flew over or somebody flew over, they would say, hey, look, go look down this valley. He's, he's headed that way. And I began working my way down the valley and, and um, remarkably saw a helicopter, the first rescue helicopter. And that was quite a relief, but it was also a bit of a concern because um, there's only so many days that you're gonna get air coverage for rescue just makes perfect sense, right? We can't, you know, find every single hiker. We can't find anybody who's injured. They've got to find me. So I get stopped out. There's a point in that valley that I couldn't get past, but I still had hydration. So I began working my way, if you will, to the right. And I, I worked my way way over to sort of this final valley on the right-hand side where I thought I had a, a shot of getting down into this sort of meadow. Slept there Thursday night. Um, began hallucinating. I, I, I thought I could hear the gas generator for a trailer where I assumed there was a command and control center, you know, overseeing the search. Uh, what I didn't know was that my daughter Meredith was in Houston really leading the search effort. Uh, Mark McConnell, uh, one of my dearest friends, one of the three guys along with Jimmy that found me, had already flown to Vegas. He was actually um, in Nevada on Thursday. Uh, Jimmy and a, another friend, the third guy, Brad Schick, uh, none of who, so Brad and Mark knew each other, but 
nobody knew Jimmy. Nobody, they, they just dropped everything and got on airplanes and flew out. Um, they're going to arrive Friday morning, but Thursday night I was, I was beginning to hallucinate. So I, I slept as best I could, tried to regain my energy and said, okay, I'm going to stay put for two days because there's sort of this rule, um, stay put, stay alive, and they'll find you, right, when it comes to mm -hmm. search and rescue. And so I'd made plans to stay put all day Friday and all day Saturday on the plateau. Um, unfortunately, um, and, I, and I'd had a very unsuccessful attempt to start a fire. I had a, a fire starter, a flint, but I couldn't get the, the tinder to ignite. And then I saw a fixed wing aircraft, an airplane uh, Friday morning, about 9.30 in the morning, which gave me great concern because where I had put myself was perfect for a helicopter, but there's no way an airplane was gonna see me. The valley was too tight. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure you know, single engine aircraft, it's very difficult to see out of anyway. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, look, you know, you've got to kind of violate the rules. You got to move again. And so I began exploring the, the plateau and I saw way out on the edge, about three quarters of a mile down the valley, I could see something that looked like a trail. So I made the decision to, to get to that trail. So I worked my way down got on the trail and began hiking down the trail Friday. Now, again, in my mind, I thought I would make my way to a meadow or a, a valley floor that I could then turn left and work my way back to the trailhead where my vehicle was. Um, walked that road for two and a half hours. Um, it, the trail entered a clearing and then the clearing came to what's called a trail registry. This is a box that you open up and there's paper in there and you would sign, you know, 7, 16, 21, Scott Townsend, I'm um, going to hike for four hours into the wilderness. And, and that way it's a safety protocol so that if, mm -hmm. if you're missing, somebody would have a record of you being there. Also by the trail registry, there was really easy access to a, a, the stream, which had, was within about 10 feet of the, the registry. But I walked past thinking, okay, I'm going to walk out. And I got onto this forest service road, began walking the road. Um, the road pitched down. So after about two and a half hours, I realized I was below the altitude where my vehicle was. I was not getting any closer. And now I got a problem because the river is about a quarter of a mile away. So I turned around and walked back and went walk back the road. I, I must have walked 200 yards on that road three times. And I realized that my brain was, was not functioning as it should. I wasn't able to make a, a decision. So I was like, okay, that's all right. You're going to walk back to the trail registry. You have access to water. That's where you're going to sit um, with hydration. You've got a number of days. You've got a, this one quarter of a cliff bar back left. You can you know, eat on that. And I mean, by this time, you must be starving. You know, oddly enough, um, no. I, I, I assume it's sort of like going on a multi-day fast. You just stop getting hungry. I actually didn't eat the last 24 hours. Um, I was drinking water, but, but my theory was if I got back to the trail registry, people come to the registry, I can stay put, I've got water, I'm fat, I can probably get a couple extra days out of my body fat, and it was going to be okay. You're not going to be pleasant, nobody's happy, yeah. but I'll be found. I got back to the registry and I was having real physical problems. I'd been in the heat for five hours, unshaded, mid-90s, depleted, um, I got back to the registry and I opened it and the last person that had signed into that particular registry had been November of 2020. So it'd been eight months since somebody had been mm. in that spot. And to be honest, that was, that was a pretty hard blow because then I realized my only chance is a helicopter. Um, and my, I hallucinations were pretty heavy. I tried to drink some water, but my dehydration level was such that it just, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to make up for it. Um, and so I, at that moment, and this is about 3.30 Friday afternoon, I felt it was very probable that when I passed out, because I felt like I was going to lose consciousness soon, that I would probably have a cardiac arrest and then just drift off uh, in my sleep and die. And so I began writing, uh, I, I took the paper and the clipboard out of the trail registry, and I began drafting letters uh, to my children, uh, to my family, my mother and two sisters, and uh, my friend Mark, and then also to whoever the unfortunate person was going to be that was going to find me, right? Mm. This horrible idea that 
you know, somebody at some point is going to find me there and sort of accepted what was going to happen and, and it probably merits saying that years ago, um, uh, my friend Mark, one of the three that I've mentioned, he and I had pledged to each other that when our time came and, and our time is going to come. So if there's anybody out there that's confused, I can assure you that the statistical probability of death uh, remains constant at 100%. Uh, none of us, <laughs> to quote Jim Morrison, nobody gets out of here alive. Right. And, and so we know it's coming and it's the question of when and how. And, and I'd pledged to Mark and, and, and he had essentially pledged to me that when our time came, we were going to go down laughing, not even smiling, because in the grand scheme of things, this amazing experience of life that that we've had, and this is before this incident, you know, my goodness, who could who could find fault? It, yes, we've all had headaches. Yes, we've had trouble. I mean, it's this is this is not a smooth road, but the fact that we get to experience it, and and I have been so fortunate, and and. My children are amazing, you know, my relationships, everything. My life in the grand scheme of things is, is a joke, uh, uh, really. And so I knew that um, when my time came that I was one of the fortunate ones. And I've sort of lived with this attitude of gratitude, if you will, not to be to so Tony Robbins about it, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, I find that, that the emotion of gratitude really makes it difficult to hold on to any negative emotions. So it's difficult to be angry. It's difficult to be resentful. It's difficult to be jealous um, if you have a sense of gratitude. And I don't know if you've, I know you're a big reader. If you haven't read any of Steven Pinker's books, uh, I'd highly recommend. So the two that I think are the best are Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. Steve Steven Pinker is a professor. Hmm. I believe in sociology at Harvard, but he's really a statistician. And so especially the Enlightenment Now book lays out the statistical argument about why we should be happy. <laughs> like, if you think across the course of human existence, this is the greatest time in history to be alive. And the time in front of us will probably be the greatest, assuming we don't decide to, to end the, the grand experiment with a nuclear war or some sort of environmental right. disaster. Like, this is the greatest time to be alive, even though it's easy to say, you know, what, oh my goodness, look at me. I, you, know, I, you don't hear too many people say that. Um, thank you. I, 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 I take that as a compliment. I, I try to emphasize it to my students, but I will tell you that it is, it has altered my life for about a decade. And I don't put this, I don't try to frame this in any sort of religious context. It's not, it's just this idea that my goodness, well, I, I, I can perhaps best explain it this way. In my notes to my children, I, I said, look, how lucky was I? And, and again, this is in this mindset that I'm going to, to pass away. I got to die doing what I love to do, lying next to a babbling brook under the trees in the grass. Like, most people don't get that. An elongated battle with a terminal disease, an instantaneous loss of life through a car crash or right. something else. And you know, here I am, I'm just gonna slip away in my sleep. Yes, I'm saddened, I'm gonna miss parts of their lives, but you know, what a joy has it been to be with them so far, right? To see them through to their 27th year. And so I lay down and I anticipated that that was gonna be it. And I blacked out probably around four, 4.15, no way to know exactly. I was hallucinating auditorily. Um, and, and, and with your indulgence, and I, yeah. I don't want, I, I hope people aren't clicking off or falling asleep as they watch this. Oh no. I hope this is providing something for you, but. Um, this is great. I was unaware obviously of everything that Meredith uh, had done, what Jessica had done what others from our class had done, Jimmy especially. Uh, you know, Jim jumped on an airplane and flew to Las Vegas and met a guy he had never met before. They rented a Jeep and they started driving four and a half hours into the desert. Oh, wow. And this is a, it's difficult 
to sort of even today learn everything that was done. Uh, there were dog rescue groups around the country that were ready to go. The Navy sent rescue helicopters. Actually, thank you so much. The governor of Nevada did get involved. His office, really? the governor of California, the governor of Oklahoma, all three got involved. Hmm. Uh, the Nevada Department of Public Safety. There were people from our class that were uh, reaching out and um, attempting to do whatever they could. Um, we had a dog group uh, called Ground Zero uh, in Oklahoma that had made the decision uh, that the, 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 the bit side note here, the, the sheriff that was in charge of the rescue crew had failed to sign the release that would allow formal rescue teams onto the mountain. Mm. And a group in Oklahoma said, all right, we're just hikers. And they took off their uniforms and put on civilian clothes. And <laughs> Sharon and uh, uh, some of the people that were around Meredith had found, th 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 sort of again, I don't want to go too deep into this, but you know, you don't just say, hey, I've got eight dogs and eight handlers. Let's get them in the mountain, right? They have to have jets and they have to have private jets and they have to have transportation from the airport to the location. They've got to have food. They've got to have housing. They've got to do, you know, to do what they do, they need all this assistance. And so Meredith and, and, and Brad Schick's wife, Jonna, and uh, two professors, uh, including David Kinzinger, who was, I don't know if you knew David when he lived in Bartlesville, he was a, an attorney at Phillips for years. He now teaches at the university. These people were, were in an inhuman way, gathering up all these resources to help. And I'm unaware of it. And so the Friday afternoon, uh, Jimmy Webb and uh, Brad Schick uh, were scouring the mountain, looking for a location that they could get as high up as they could in the Jeep, and then they would hike. So their plan was, we're gonna, we're gonna do some reconnaissance Friday afternoon. We'll begin our hike Saturday. We'll sleep on the mountain Saturday night if we haven't found him, and then we'll search on Sunday as well. Well, they ended up driving the Forest Service Road that I had walked Friday afternoon. Hmm. They came to the end of that road at approximately, and, and they've told me this, I obviously don't know it, but at about 6.30 p.m. Friday afternoon, I am passed out 250 yards away in the trees and they can't see me. And I obviously don't know they're there. Wow. And so for about 10 minutes, they're there and they're like, well, we don't have our gear. It's getting late. Let's just go back. And so they drove back about an hour away. And they were that close. They were that close. They're about 250 yards away. Um, I apologize. It takes a little bit of time here to tell the rest of the story. So Saturday morning, well, actually Friday night, uh, they're in this uh, little restaurant, this one restaurant in the town of Dyer, Nevada called Boonies. And they've got their maps out, Mark, Jim, and Brad do. And they're, they're, they're attempting to build a plan for Saturday and Sunday. Where's, what have we learned? Mark had, had just, Mark is a, is a world-class mountain climber, but had pushed his body to 11,000 feet twice. He had developed hypoxia, so altitude sickness, and he was still going. It was incredible what he was able to do. But they, were, they lay out their maps and they begin sort of figuring out a plan. And the young waitress, uh, uh, faithfully named Destiny, uh, came over and said, hey, I, I heard the sheriff pinged your buddy's cell phone. Everybody in town knew what was going on. And they said, yeah, but you know, we don't, we don't know where the ping took place. And so the waitress sort of leans over and says, well, look, there's only one cell phone tower and it's right here. And they pointed to a spot on the map. And, and so Jim went over and talked to her a bit more. And Matt, Mark and Brad were laying out a plan. And Jim came back and said, look, guys, can't tell you why. I don't know why, but we must go back to that Forest Service Road. And so they made the plan the Saturday morning. They drive back to the Forest Service Road. And that's where they were going to begin their hike. And so bounce back now, it's Friday night. I wake up at about eight o'clock, which surprised me to say the least. And I began making notes for a plan. And the plan was I was going to walk the Forest Service Road at night, sleep during the day, and I was either going to find a rescuer or I wasn't. That was really the only two options. And uh, frankly, I became quite excited because when you get, at least when I got to the point where I called it plan Z. There's no other letter in the alphabet, right? This is going to be it. Right. Plan A, B, and C didn't work. Plan Z, this is all I got left. Um, so I went to sleep Friday night, woke up Saturday morning. 
um, did what I did every morning, take off my rain gear, lay it in a clearing, you know, sort of start making uh, signals if I could to anybody flying over. And a helicopter flew over early Saturday morning and got very close. It was the closest helicopter in the entire five day ordeal that I felt truly had seen me. And so I got quite elated and thought, my goodness, I'm saved. And sadly, the, the helicopter banked away and flew. Uh, but I, I was like, you know, that's okay. I, I've got my plan and I'm gonna do it. And so about 9.15, I had put my, my backpack and this clipboard where I was taking all my notes. And I was, I was taking notes such as, all right, you know, I've got twisted left ankle, I got lacerations, I got some bruising, but I'm overall okay. Drew a map that said, hey, this is the route I'm taking. I was gonna leave it there at the parking area uh, of the forest service road, the, the, the dead end of the forest service road. Began uh, um, planning to re-bandage my feet. I had my first aid kit and I knew my feet were, were pretty torn up, but I thought I could get those ready to go. And so the day Saturday was going to be spent hydrating, eating a little bit of nutrition and preparing myself to walk out into Death Valley or, or somewhere near Death Valley. Um, six o'clock that night. And then, um, like I said, the helicopter comes over, I'm quite down. I wrote that in my notes and I was quite depressed. And, but anyway, there was a hill, um, uh, sort of up trail from this clearing I was in. And I climbed up, it was about hundred feet up and I climbed up this hill and my thought was I could get to the top of the hill and I could maybe see over the trees, see down the road and, and know what I was facing Saturday night for this, this long hike. And at 9.45, I heard what I thought was a car beep, beep, beep. And I began hearing voices again. One of my hallucinations was voices. So I looked at my watch and thought, well, no oh crap. Okay, it's 9.45, auditory hallucinations are back. All right, you've got to go write that on your notes. And that's, my notes were on a clipboard, which is sitting on the trail registry. This, if you will, this podium that opens up that you sign in on. I, and, then, and this kind of gave you some sense of purpose, probably. Is this... Absolutely correct. It was it was more important to keep my mind mm -hmm. occupied than it was to write down. Now, I thought, look, if I don't survive and the Forest Service can use these notes to help in the future, great. I think I said to them, it'll be a small contribution. But yeah, it was mostly to keep my mind occupied because for me, you know, I, even though I have sort of this positive attitude, I couldn't help think, all right, I think I understand biologically what's happening. I think I know the math. Mm -hmm. By this time, nobody, now there were people that were, were eternally hopeful, but if you knew the situation, you weren't, you weren't running to Vegas to lay a bet on me being found. Um, so anyway, I, I start climbing down this hill to, to get to the trail registry so I can put my note down that uh, my hallucinations were back, but they weren't hallucinations, it was Jimmy. Mark and Brad, they had locked their cars and they had grabbed their backpacks and they were walking through the trees towards the trail registry. Mark and, and Jim and Brad, Jim gets to the trail registry first, Mark and Brad show up, they see the backpack uh, and Mark knew that I, I carried a particular brand of gear. But that's like saying, Scott Townsend wears polo. Like, it, you know, it's just sort of like a thing. Okay, it's a black dime in a scent bag, you know, Butch carries a scent. Brad reaches down, he finds his clipboard where I have written a note and had drawn a map of, hey, here's how I'm gonna to try to walk out of here beginning six o'clock tonight. And then they saw my car keys or they saw keys to a Toyota. I should be better about that. Um, and that really knocked the wind out of them. And then when they saw my name on the credit cards, um, Brad, Mark and Jim had sort of accepted the fact that things had gone the wrong way um, I had died somewhere on the mountains. Another hiker had found my backpack and had put it here on the registry. Um, it, it just so turns out I had made it to the bottom of the hill. I had begun walking through the clearing to get to the registry. And Jimmy was the first one to see me. He screamed out. Mark looked up and, and thought I was simply the guy that had found Butch's backpack. <laughs> uh, they didn't expect to see me. And then Jim realized who I was. And the three of them began running up trail towards me into this clearing. So we're about 75 yards apart, screaming. I get a couple of steps forward and I hit my knees. I just am bawling. And they tackle me, as you can imagine. Everybody's crying, everybody's laughing. Nobody uh, 
had predicted this ending. And so um, I honestly thought I was hallucinating. I, I kept pushing on Brad's leg, um, asking if he was real because I couldn't, I couldn't get my mind convinced that what was really happening was not a hallucination. I had told them that, you know, I've been out here for a while. I, I think I may be in a dream. I didn't, didn't yet understand what was happening. And they were able to convince me that no, in fact, it was, uh, was not a dream. And, uh, and we gathered up my gear and, and uh, of course we were just, everybody's crying, everybody's hugging. It's, it's a, it's an ending that nobody thought was going to happen. And, and, uh, and we get back to the Jeep and the truck that they had rented and we began driving down the mountain and about a mile and a half down mountain uh, ran into the Nye County search and rescue squad. That's a, you may have seen that photograph um, with the gentleman um, uh, kind of got into the press pretty quickly, but um, I'm standing there with that search and rescue crew. They had a medic. Who oh did a yeah. Quick, yeah. Quick, quick look at me and say, okay, look, I think you can make it to the hospital. Um, Brad and Mark and, 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 and I have to mention this and just, if you'll bear with me, it's yeah. Sharon, uh, the twins, mom, my ex-wife, Sharon wins that everybody knows. Um, her husband flew from San Antonio to Vegas and had driven up into the desert to assist in the search and rescue. Um, he actually gave me a hard time and said, you know, why didn't you hide for two more hours till I could make it to the actual rescue moment? Uh, but I was so touched. And again, this is sort of where I am now emotionally with all of this. How do you find the words to tell people thank you? How do you express gratitude when something like that happens? Um, but anyway, so Brad, Mark, and, and Barry uh, went to go get my truck because it was still at the trailhead about an hour away. Jimmy uh, got the, the uh, dubious honor of driving me to the, the hospital, which was about an hour and a half away uh, in California. This is, like I said, the very remote area. Being a doctor, that probably makes sense. Well, and it, and it, and it, it turned into a bit of a, a, a funny moment. Um, Jim, the, the, the rescue crew had alerted the hospital that I was coming. So they had a crash team there and, and Jim had called and said, look, I'm bringing him in. He looks okay, mostly. Um, uh, we get to the ER, we get in, the team grabs me and they begin, you know, putting IVs in me, running tests. And, and uh, Jimmy uh, goes up to the head ER guy and says, look, I don't want to interfere, but it looks like the majority of the damage is to his feet. I'm a podiatrist. If you would like me to, I will take care of, take care of that part. And the CR doc just instantaneously said, yeah, get after it. And so I'm laying on this, this table in the ER in Bishop, California, in the Inyo Regional Hospital Emergency Room. And our class president is performing surgery on my feet for procedures. <laughs> I don't think you would appreciate it. Calling it surgery. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I had some open wounds, blisters, lost some toenails, that sort of thing. But Jim took care of me. And... Um, along with being one of my dearest friends, right? How do you, how do you account for you know, him being there? So I told the, uh, the head doc uh, on site that, look, I travel with my own podiatrist because I know these sorts of things can happen. So <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, we, you know, I was in the hospital for about five, six hours. All the tests came back negative. There were a couple they couldn't run that I had to do in Oklahoma, but I was mostly in, in good health, right? And so it brought me back uh, to, uh, this little town of Dyer, Nevada. And then Sunday, uh, my daughter Meredith flew up from Houston and she and I drove back and everybody got flights and flew back. And, and here we are a couple of weeks later and it's, it's, uh, I'm still sort of in awe of what everybody did and, and um, what people were willing to do uh, to, to save me. And, and I'm, and I think like I said, I've had three lifetimes. I couldn't tell everybody, thank you enough. It's, uh, it's a remarkable outcome that uh, certainly wasn't predicted. It was. It was a remarkable and is a remarkable outcome. There's well, I hope we haven't. I hope we haven't lost any of your your viewers. I, that, that dragged on a bit. I apologize, but it's. I, I don't know how to tell a short version of it. I mean, the short version is, I survived for five days long enough for people to find me. I, it doesn't seem to do it justice. I'll just edit. 
down to that part right there. The yeah, exactly. Just cut it all. I like <laughs> you could you could even you know, subtitle this particular episode "Fat <coughs> Boy Survive." Something like that would probably be as close as close as you could to uh, uh, incorporate it. But yeah, no, is no. It's I think the Wildcats, cool. any Wildcat listening, watching, all want to know, and you know, everyone. Uh, you know, I was very grateful that you were willing to spend the time to talk about it. I thought, you know, personally, I thought, you know, he might be, this might be too early, too soon, uh, whatever, you know, just whatever he wants to do, I'll, I'll do it, you know, and uh, if he doesn't want to do it, cool, no, no harm, no foul. It was real, almost selfishly, this is yet another platform where I can tell people thank you, especially people from, from our high school and specifically our graduating class. Yes. Yeah. I, I was hearing from people that I hadn't heard from in, in, in quite some time, right? Well, you and I haven't spoken in 39 I, years, you know? Exactly. And, and so how wonderful is this? How beautiful is it that it uh, brings us together? I think Glenn said even in his interview, you know, this technology that we're faced with has allowed us to reconnect with people that we had lost connections. And if this incident has reconnected me with people, you know, great. I, I had seen Chris a couple of times over the years. I'd seen Brett several times. But it, you know, Stacy Dennis, Donnie Moreland, you, these are it, what a joy it is for me and 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 how grateful I am to get the chance to to reconnect. Yeah, well, that's great. And when you're in Bartlesville or if I'm in Norman, whatever, we should go drink some coffee or something. Well, absolutely. And in fact, um, it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, I'm in Bartlesville actually quite a bit. I try to get up to see Jim. My, my parents are no longer there, but uh, um, and my father passed away and my mother lives here in Oklahoma City near me. And we, uh, um, I, I, because of Jimmy and other friends, I go up as often as I can. And in fact, I, uh, one of the, the other rescuers, Brad Schick, uh, I drug him to uh, Bartlesville, so he and Jim and I could have a celebratory dinner at Murphy's. Yeah, uh, yeah. Had, had had never had a hot hamburger, and although his cardiologist is now very upset with him, he uh, <laughs> he really enjoyed it. And so uh, I'm actually up there uh, quite a bit. I see you know I saw friends there, and I try to come. And uh, I'd even joked with Jim uh, last year, but of course it's taken a much more much more uh, urgent thought now that. Uh, Look, when I retire, I may I may move back to Bartlesville. It's a wonderful community, and, and uh, love the people that are there. And, and knowing how many people now are are either living there or working there from our classes is, is even better. Well, it's a great story. It's, it's I mean, it's an it's, a, it's an impactful story, and it got a good ending, which is wonderful. And uh, so glad that uh, you know that. It, one part of the story that really strikes me is the point where you were writing and uh, you, you were, and then you said you passed out and then woke back up. Yes. And you probably thought, I, I don't know, tell me, it, it seems like what I heard you say was when, when you woke up, it was like, well, dang, I thought I was going to die and I didn't. So Okay, here we go. Plan Z, you know. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 you know, I, I I don't understand how the mind works, but I would say that it was interesting. I actually had to go back to the notes, the letters I'd written my children, and I did sort of a in okay. So I made it to eight o'clock Friday night, right? The, sort of at the bottom of the note. Um, they've not yet read those letters. They're they're not ready. I don't know how long it'll take them till they are ready, but. Yeah, but then immediately my my brain just said, "All right, great, you're here. What are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do to solve this problem?" And that's when I began devising this idea that I, you know, I was going to walk out and and you know I, I I felt decent probability I could survive it. I knew I was going to be, I probably would have access to water. Um, I felt like, look, if I if I get into the valley floor, maybe I can make it to a highway and somebody can find me in this room. Yeah. Final last question. Um, sure. And I ask everybody the same question. It's, this is almost like a sociological experiment. You know, 40 years later, what would you tell 
you know, your younger self as Butch is coming off the graduating platform. And, you know, I was thinking last night, we act, you know, there is no such thing as a time machine, but actually we do have the chance to do this with our own children. Correct. So, you know, whether it's, it's you going back to, you know, your former self, or if it's going to your children and saying, look, bottom line, this is why I want you to know, what, what, what's that going to be? Well, you know, I'll even add to it, you know, I'm extraordinarily fortunate doing what I do now for a living, you know, higher education, I get to talk to students uh, every day, hundreds of them about just this topic. And I would, I would say this, it's okay to be different. I tell my, my daughters and tell my students, and I, I burned so much energy and so much time in high school desperately wanting to be like everybody else. Um, with all due respect to Chris Service, who I, I learned through this show was, was anxious about high school. I was, I lived my entire junior high and high school life completely intimidated by everybody. I, I thought everybody else knew how the world worked but me. I thought everybody was smarter than me. I thought everybody was certainly wealthier than me. I thought yeah. everybody was cooler than me. Everybody yeah. knew the world, how the world worked, but me. Mm -hmm. I was so intimidated by that. And I was like, okay, all you have to do is fit in. If you can just be like everybody else, this is, yeah. this is how you can make it. And, and maybe that's, maybe that was our drive to become adults. We thought, well, look, when I look at adults, they're sort of homogeneous, right? They all kind of look and act the same. And if we could just get there, you know, life will be great. Um, and don't, you know, be different. Um, understand if you can, what gifts you have, right? you know, what cards, <laughs> what cards fell your way, fell your way in the role of the genetic dice. What did you have from this amazing education we received? And now go do that, quit. Quit attempting to be like everyone else, um, especially now knowing that, you know, someone is, is sorry, I feel like Chris is going to send me a quite a mean text. I don't blame him. You know, <laughs> seeing somebody like Chris Service, who I sort of epitomized and thought, well, this, you know, this is a guy who's athlete, he's, he's popular, he, he, he gets along with everybody. I mean, everybody loved Chris Service in high school. Right. Like to hear as an adult, Chris say something like, oh, I was just completely anxious. I just felt, yeah. For me, you know, it was just a confirmation of this idea that none of us knew what was going on. I, well, with the exception of Jim Webb. Maybe Jim knew and nobody else did. We'll, <laughs> we'll give him that benefit of the doubt. Maybe we'll uh, ask him sometime. Ask him sometime. Well, I, I, I hope you don't mind. No. Uh, he got, a, he got a, quite a stern text message from me last night saying, you're going to do this show. I don't care. You, there will be no excuses if I have to come and drag you. Uh, to Scott's home, you're going to do this show. So he's yeah. he's going to do it. Um, Good. It, but yeah, it, just be yourself. It's okay. Um, you know, I guess a, a subtext to that would be don't rush to become an adult. There was no need. Yeah. That's great, Butch. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing your story and, and for uh, all the lessons that uh, that story teaches us. And well, thank Man, you for doing this, Scott. This is, uh, like I said, I, I, I've watched the Scott Sound Townsend show, right? So, so, and then your willingness to do this, I think, is is going to be amazing for us. We should put it in a time capsule, and of course, right? It, well, know, we have, right? We call it the cloud now, but we have a time capsule, and yeah. and we'll be able to draw this down, and and our children, and maybe even our grandchildren, will be able to yeah. to watch. Oh look, there's there's our grandfather Scott talking about these things, and and what an amazing uh, amazing gift you've given us. And so, on behalf of, of myself and everybody else in the class, thank you for doing this. This is a remarkable gift uh, you've given us, and and I'm I know many many others will be be thrilled to participate with you. Well, I can't take all the credit. We'll have to, you know, Stacy Dennis is part to blame for this. It was her idea to begin with, you know. What what an amazing person Stacy mm -hmm. is. I, loved her her interview and yes and i i love the fact that she's encouraged you to do this because uh, mm -hmm. that sounds like stacy to me you're right all right butch well thanks a lot for your time thanks for joining yeah. us um for more information if people want to get in touch with you where would they go 
you know, the, the best place is uh, quite simple. It's Ron, sorry, that's how I'm known in professional circles. Ron.bolin at ou.edu. It's about as simple as it is. Okay. Uh, and I would love to hear from others and, and certainly began that process and, and reaching back out to everybody that, because of the recent incident, you know, would have, have sort of come back into my sphere. I love it. I'm having a great time. Great. Well, here we are for Ron Bolin. This is Scott Townsend. Thanks for joining the Last of the Wildcats 1982 podcast. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. The Last of the Call High Wildcats 1982 podcast is a Dizzo Man production. For more episodes, visit the Last of the Call High Wildcats 1982 YouTube channel, listen on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Mm-hmm.